Northern Raiders steal a Southern locomotive. A Union general captured in bed. Rebel earthworks blown sky high. And a daring plot to burn New York City. Clandestine plans fueled by ingenuity and bravado, they defied the odds for a chance at success. They were the secret missions of the Civil War. In the annals of the Civil War, the great battles dominate. Names like Gettysburg, Chancellorsville, or Antietam are famous by sheer weight of blood and horror. Where armies of men by the tens of thousands opposed each other, these were the vast, open, visible spectacles of the conflict. But the well-worn archives of that time are also filled with the details of far lesser known actions. They were clever, daring, covert operations designed to frighten the enemy, disrupt his supplies, and destroy his morale. This is not lines of soldiers fighting each other. You always know what's going on. You see these people. Instead, you never know where they're going to hit. They aren't following the traditional rules of war. So they really have the ability to scare people. Each side in the war had a so-called secret service, which initiated some missions. But neither had anything like today's CIA to coordinate covert actions. Instead, the secret missions of the Civil War were conceived and executed in every corner where the conflict was fought. Occasionally directed from high levels, they were more likely the work of local commanders, spies in the field, even ordinary soldiers. Secret missions tested the limits of the rules of engagement as each side sought its magic bullet to bring the war to its quickest end. In 1862, undercover Union operatives carried out a secret mission designed to strike at railroads deep inside the Confederacy. Their target was a train in Georgia manned by a civilian conductor and crew. The goal was to sever the supply line between two of the South's key cities. If this had succeeded, this, this would have ended the war by two full years. It was very dramatic. It would have completely destroyed the uh, railroad line to Chattanooga and left Atlanta uh, very vulnerable. The secret mission became known as the Great Locomotive Chase. In April 1862, the Confederacy's main line of defense extended from Richmond, Virginia, and ran parallel to a railroad line that was critical to the South's survival. It was 825 miles long and stretched all the way to Memphis, Tennessee. The Civil War is the first war in which railroading is going to play a major role. Any areas where railroads intersected or were near cities were important places in those days. One of those cities was Chattanooga, Tennessee. If the North could capture it, the Confederacy would effectively be cut in half. Union General Ormsby Mitchell planned to do just that. To make it possible, he needed to cut off Chattanooga's supply line to the Deep South along a critical railroad called the Western and Atlantic, running through Georgia to Atlanta. A secret mission was organized to do it, and the man who stepped up to lead it was a civilian named James J. Andrews. James J. Andrews was a very mysterious fellow. Not a lot is known about him. He was pretty much playing both ends against the middle. Andrews was a Union spy who posed as a smuggler, bringing medical supplies to the South while providing intelligence to the North. On April 7, 1862, as the Battle of Shiloh raged to the west, Andrews met secretly with General Mitchell at his headquarters in Shelbyville, south of Nashville. 
William Pittenger, one of the men who took part in the plot, wrote what he knew of the clandestine meeting years later. Andrews and Mitchell concerted the plan, with all the accessible maps of the enemy's country spread out before them. Pittenger revealed the details of the plot in a book called Daring and Suffering. It was the most complete of all the personal accounts of a secret mission, which, in its planning, was known only to a select few. Andrews proposed a daring plan to take a small party of fearless men, disguise them as southern citizens, capture a locomotive, cut the telegraph wires, then run through Chattanooga, burning the bridges behind him. But the plan didn't stop there. On the same day Andrews and his men stole the train, Mitchell would leave Shelbyville and march on Huntsville, Alabama, and then on to Chattanooga. It would be an easy victory after rail support from Atlanta was cut off. The mysterious Andrew, said to have originated the plan, may have been following higher orders. This was something I think that orders came down from the top, very secret. I think uh, it was strictly Union Secret Service. The Union Secret Service was a network of spies originally headed by Alan Pinkerton, the famous private detective. Its purpose in conducting espionage might well have given it a hidden role in James Andrews' elaborate secret mission. Especially when you got 22 to 24 Union soldiers going along with this man. He didn't just do this off the cuff. This wasn't something that just let's get together over a bottle and, 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 and shoot the breeze and plan this crazy mission. The role of the Secret Service is not documented, but the rest of the story is. Two dozen Union soldiers in Mitchell's division volunteered. Three of them were recruited because they were trained locomotive engineers. None of them even knew what the mission would be. They did tell them that it was a very secret mission and that it was a very dangerous mission and that if they were caught, they would probably be hung. Just hours after his April 7th meeting with General Mitchell, Andrews gathered his men at an isolated spot along the railroad tracks outside Shelbyville. Andrews briefed them on the audacious plan to actually steal a locomotive. As he outlined the damage to be done to the enemy, fear gave way to excitement. William Pittenger would never forget it. The idea of a few disguised men suddenly seizing a train far within the enemy's lines, cutting the telegraph wires, burning bridges, and leaving the foe in helpless rage behind was the very sublimity and romance of war. They were given weapons. Some of them were given money. They started walking from Shelbyville to Chattanooga, which is over 100 miles, through the Cumberland Mountains. From Chattanooga, they would take the train south to Georgia to carry out their plans. But rough weather delayed them. Andrews assumed General Mitchell would also be delayed in attacking Huntsville, and so postponed the railroad raid by one day. The change in timing would prove critical to the mission's outcome. Pittenger recalled his commander's words. If we burn those bridges, Mitchell will capture Chattanooga the next day, but we must be prompt. If he gets to Huntsville before us, the road will be so crowded with reinforcements moving against him that our task will be much harder. At 4 a.m. on April 12, 1862, a train pulled by a locomotive called the General began its run from Atlanta bound for Chattanooga, 120 miles to the north. Starting in Atlanta, conductor William Fuller and his train traveled to Marietta, 20 miles to the north. There, James Andrews and his men quietly got on board as regular passengers. Only seven more miles up the line was the next station, a place called Big Shanty, where the secret mission would be launched. About five minutes after six, the train stopped at Big Shanty. The conductor stood up, said 20 minutes for breakfast. The crew and most passengers went to eat at the Lacey Hotel just a few steps away from the train. On the other side of the tracks was Camp McDonald, a training base for as many as 4,000 Confederate troops. In the middle of all this activity stood the general. Locomotives were never locked at this time. It took an expert to operate one, and stealing a train 
was simply beyond all imagination. Andrews and his experienced railroad men calmly and quietly took over the controls on the engine. They checked the fire and steam pressure as the rest of the Yankees hid inside a boxcar. Andrews gave the command, his engineer opened the throttle, and the train slipped away. On one side, the conductor is going into the hotel to have breakfast. On the other side, 4,000 Confederate troops, you know, maybe a sentry walking back alongside the tracks. And Mr. Andrews just tipping his hat, and, and off they went. I mean, that takes a lot of brass. Conductor Fuller bolted from the breakfast table. Someone who has no right has gone off with our train, he said. A secret mission was being launched. The great locomotive chase had begun. On April 12, 1862, railroad conductor William Fuller was running faster than he ever ran in his life. At the station in Big Shanty, Georgia, a team of Yankees disguised as civilians quietly stole Fuller's train as he sat down to breakfast. And you got to remember that William Fuller is the boss. He's the conductor, and the conductor was responsible for that locomotive. For him to be sitting there eating biscuits and gravy and somebody steal his locomotive was a very bad thing for him. He was in a real pickle. Fuller, together with railroad supervisor Anthony Murphy, ran down the line in a scene that even to the stunned spectators was comic. These determined men, without a moment's delay, put out after the flying train amidst shouts of laughter by the crowd at seeing men start after a train on foot. The humor is not lost to history. The chase inspired Buster Keaton's famous 1927 film, the general. Even if most others can laugh at the thought of this scene today, Conductor Fuller's family knows all too well that their ancestor at the time could not. I don't know that uh, uh, my great-grandfather would have seen any humor in it at that time uh, at all. In fact, the situation was more serious than even Fuller imagined. He thought the train had been stolen by Confederate deserters, never thinking that Yankees on a secret mission were behind it. They intended to use the train to burn bridges and block the line. As soon as the train was beyond Big Shanty, where they hijacked it, Andrew's men cut the telegraph wire. Minutes later, they came to the next stop, a place called Moon Station. Get down the road to Moon Station, and there is a Confederate crew there working on the line. Andrews tells these guys, I've got an emergency load of powder that I've got to get through to General Beauregard. Beauregard commanded the Southern troops opposing the Union advance after the Battle of Shiloh. By appearing to be legitimate, Andrews would avoid interference and even get help along the way. The mission would remain secret. He told the same story at every stop. Andrews was a great actor. You got to remember that he was dressed to the hill. He had on a top hat, he had on a vest, a chain, boots. He really looked like a man of authority. The track crew gave Andrew's men an iron pry bar they later used for tearing up track to avoid pursuit. But it lacked the claw foot ideal for prying up spikes, so a simple job became a fretful chore. They're trying to pull the spikes out. The others are just pulling up on the rail maybe digging around with their hands, trying to lift this tie up. It was crazy. They were trying to, they, they really broke their back doing this. Back at Moon Station, Conductor Fuller arrived on foot after a two-mile run. The track crew gave him a pole car to continue the chase. This was a pole and a flat, flat platform on top of four wheels and you pulled it, you pushed and pushed. This was all muscle, that's all it was. After pursuing the general on foot, the pole car was an improvement. A downgrade on the rail line gave the men more speed than running, but the chase was still a monumental struggle. I don't think there's too many people today that would even attempt pushing a, a little, an iron cart, <laughs> eight or nine miles. 
I'd be dead out of a heart attack with this thing. It, you know, and I think a lot of other people would too. <laughs> But before long, the pole car came to the spot where Andrews and his men had pried a rail from the track. Tumbles them off in the ditch. They get up muddy and mad. Now they really realize that this is not deserters from the Confederate camp. This has got to be Yankees. The Yankees, unaware Fuller was after them, pulled the general into Kingston Station, 30 miles from the point where they stole the train. Here, traffic on the single-line railroad began to jeopardize the mission. You have to remember that there's only one track running from Atlanta to Chattanooga, it's just one track. So if you got a southbound and a northbound coming, somebody's got to get off. Getting off meant pulling a switch to steer a train onto a siding at one of the stations along the line. On just such a siding, the general with Andrews and his men aboard waited. And waited. At least three unscheduled trains moving south occupied the main line while the general sat still. The problem was with Andrews was that he, he delayed the mission one day. Andrews didn't know that Union General Ormsby Mitchell attacked Huntsville, Alabama one day earlier, as they had originally planned. Word of the assault quickly reached Chattanooga. That put a scare in the Confederates, and the Confederates loaded up everything they could and sent it south. That blocked the line the next day when Andrews did make the raid. The line was full of locomotives coming south. This was something Andrews had not foreseen. The unscheduled traffic from Chattanooga kept the general stalled at Kingston. William Pittenger, one of the men hiding inside a boxcar, remembered the uncertainty. We could hear low murmurs outside. We knew that we were at a station and alongside another train and could hear the tread of feet, but we could not learn why we did not press on. Andrews is in a real hot spot here. People are getting suspicious around the station. They're asking questions. Andrews pulls out his powder story again. I am ordered to get this powder through to Beauregard at the earliest possible moment, Andrews told them. I must be off at the very first minute that is possible. After waiting more than an hour, the general finally steamed away. After Andrews and his men leave Kingston Station. About five minutes later, up pulls William Fuller. Fuller's frantic trip with the pole car had taken him from Moon Station, 11 miles north, to Etowah Station. There, he boarded another locomotive and rushed another six miles to Kingston. Andrews still did not know Fuller was in pursuit. I don't think he knew who Fuller was. Angry, I don't think would be the word. This guy was furious. Furious and again without transportation north of Kingston Station, Fuller and Murphy were once more on foot. All the northbound locomotives on the line were blocked by traffic or track obstructions left by the Yankees. Fuller and Murphy had no choice but to run in a chase that seemed impossible. Neither one knew that help was just around the bend. It must have seemed a dark and harrowing deja vu for William Fuller and Anthony Murphy. More than once, the two Georgia Railroad men were forced to run on foot after a gang of Yankees who had stolen their train and may have been miles ahead of them to the north. Fuller and Murphy might have run until they dropped had not the southbound Texas come toward them. Frantically, they flagged it down. Murphy and Fuller arrive out of breath on foot, and they explain that they're chasing these Union spies that just stole on a train. Minutes later, the Texas was in on the chase at high speed. Its only handicap, its direction of travel. Now you gotta remember, this locomotive's in reverse. 
Locomotive will go just as fast in reverse as it will forward, but it's a lot more dangerous. Hearing the whistle from the Texas behind them, Andrews now knew he was being pursued. The general poured on steam, reaching speeds up to 60 miles per hour. Going 60 miles an hour was totally unheard of at that time. It was like being in a rocket ship. They were being thrown around the cab, thrown around the boxcar. Alf Wilson, one of Andrews' men, remembered the frightening ordeal. A powerful iron monster rocked and reeled like a drunken man, while we tumbled from side to side like grains of popcorn in a hot frying pan. We took little thought of the matter then. Death in a railroad smash-up would have been preferred by us to capture. There was no longer time to burn bridges as they planned. Andrew's men could do little to slow down the Texas. They couldn't stop to pry up rails. Instead, they dropped railroad ties on the tracks as they moved. But these were only minor annoyances for Fuller and his companions. What began as a mission of controlled sabotage by the Union Raiders quickly became a mission of survival. With the Texas close behind, the Yankees did not have time to stop and load up enough wood and water to maintain speed. The shortage would be critical. That truly was the downfall of the raid once the Confederates started hounding these guys. And eventually the wood and water ran out. Andrew said every man for himself, and they hit the woods. The great locomotive chase became a frantic manhunt two miles north of Ringgold, Georgia, 87 miles from its starting point. The Yankees dispersed through the woods. Andrews had told General Mitchell he would burn the bridges on the Western and Atlantic Railroad, making it impossible to use. As it was, there wasn't time to burn a single bridge. Damaged track and severed telegraph wires were easy to repair. The raid was a failure. Andrews and his men didn't get far after their escape through the woods. Confederate soldiers fanned out after them, and all were caught within 12 days. The raiders were convicted of being spies. On June 8, 1862, James Andrews went to the scaffold, appearing penitent, as a newspaper reported. Seven of his men were executed together 10 days later, one of them telling the assembled crowd he was no spy, but simply a soldier in the performance of duty. Eight other raiders escaped, and the remainder were released in a prisoner exchange in March of 1863. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton called them to Washington. Congress had just authorized the Medal of Honor, and Andrews' men became the very first recipients. Andrews himself was a civilian and was not eligible. A series of watercolors about the chase was painted by Chicago artist Wilbur Kurtz. He was so fascinated by the story, he became personally involved. To research his work, Kurtz interviewed the train's conductor, William Fuller, in 1903. Later, the artist married Fuller's daughter, Annie Laurie. So that today's Wilbur Kurtz III is the grandson of the artist and great-grandson of the conductor. It's been an exciting story all of my life, especially coming from my grandfather, who, while did not have firsthand accounts of it, he had almost coming directly from Captain Fuller. Buster Keaton's comedy was one of two major movies inspired by the story. The Great Locomotive Chase from Walt Disney Studios in 1956 was a serious version. Today, the general is preserved at the Southern Museum of Civil War and Locomotive History in Kennesaw, Georgia, the town once known as Big Shanty. The Yankees who tried to capture it may have failed, but like most secret missions, the raid had lasting effects. I think the South was in an uproar. It pulled a lot of, of troops away from important places where they should have been to guard bridges and railroad points throughout the South because they were afraid it was gonna happen again. 
The Confederacy instituted a system of passports to guard against spies, and strangers would from then on be treated with much more suspicion across the South. In the year following the great locomotive chase, the Union became frustrated by its Army's lack of decisive victories. General George B. McClellan's campaign to take Richmond was a failure. President Lincoln replaced him with General Ambrose Burnside, who fared even worse. The South, if not headed to victory itself, was conducting a vigorous defense. In the winter of 1863, the fighting slowed down, and a Confederate named Mosby saw an opportunity. He devised a secret mission aimed at Union troops occupying Northern Virginia. Mosby was a master of secret missions. He, uh, he gained his nickname, the Gray Ghost, because the Union never knew where he was going to be coming from or where he disappeared to after the mission. The Gray Ghost was Lieutenant John Singleton Mosby, once a scout for General Jeb Stuart. The secret mission Mosby conducted at Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia, in March 1863 was aimed at capturing just one man, but it accomplished far more. Striking at the very heart of a federal command center, Mosby sent the Union reeling, audaciously seizing officers, horses, weapons. Overnight, the Gray Ghost would become the scourge of the North. Mosby knew that just a few soldiers operating in this secretive, surprise manner were enough to send everybody scurrying because nobody ever knew what was going to happen. Mosby formed a company of guerrilla fighters on January 1st, 1863, the same day the Union put the Emancipation Proclamation into effect. The Civil War was nearing its midpoint. In the Eastern Theater of War, the action was concentrated in the Mid-Atlantic region, where Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia had dealt the Union humiliating defeats. Washington, D.C., located precariously on the rebel border, was under constant threat. The federal capital was protected by a defensive ring of Union troops extending deep into the surrounding territory of Northern Virginia. Around Washington, uh, the entire national capital had been turned into a huge fortress. There were large concentrations of troops right outside of Washington and just to the south of it. These troops became targets for John Mosby, a Virginian of slight build but great confidence. His ego was bigger than his uh, physical being, and so he became a, a very vibrant individual uh, with a lot of charisma. Mosby's Rangers, as they were known, were cavalrymen armed with little more than revolvers, silently capturing men, weapons, and horses in small hit-and-run actions. This was a, a new, dangerous way of fighting that really distracted the Union forces. In his own memoirs, he described the effects of his sneak attacks against Union pickets doing guard duty on the Washington perimeter. Up to that time, the pickets had passed a quiet life in their camps, but now they were kept under arms and awake all night by a foe who generally assailed them where he was least expected. He would come in, basically kick someone in a knee and run away and retreat. And in the sensibilities of the day, that seemed very underhanded. It seemed especially underhanded to Colonel Percy Wyndham, a British soldier of fortune fighting for the Union. For Wyndham, honorable warfare was fought out in the open. His troops no doubt had to endure frequent tirades as he criticized Mosby at every opportunity. Wyndham even sent Mosby a note with a direct insult. <laughs> the loss of sleep is irritating to anybody. He sent me a message calling me a horse thief. Calling someone a horse thief in those days was tantamount to calling your mother a whore. But Mosby was a man of honor himself, and to retaliate against Wyndham, he conceived a secret mission. 
He planned a nighttime raid on Fairfax Courthouse, a tiny village no more than a few blocks square. Mosby knew that Colonel Wyndham's headquarters was in Fairfax Courthouse, and the primary objective of the raid was to capture Wyndham, uh, this invader from Europe, no less, and give him his comeuppance. On March 8, 1863, Mosby collected his small group of men. He said they'd be going on a raid that night, but he told them very little else. To all but a few, the mission remained secret. He kept it secret because he wanted to make sure that if someone was captured, they didn't have the information that they could blurt out, which would then put the rest of the gang in jeopardy. In the black darkness of a moonless night, Mosby and his men slowly made their way through the Virginia woods. Fairfax was 25 miles away, deep behind Union lines. A Union defector, Sergeant James Ames, helped Mosby pick his way through gaps in the federal sentry positions. But progress through the woods was slow. In the darkness, the Rangers had trouble staying together. They were lucky if they could see past the end of their horse's nose. The term that comes to mind is pitch black in the sense that not only can you simply not see, but it is so dark that you feel like it is getting on you. It is sticky dark. But the profound dark worked for Mosby's Rangers when they finally reached their destination at 2 o'clock in the morning. We entered the village from the direction of the railroad station. There were a few sentinels about the town, but it was so dark they could not distinguish us from their own people. In the cold of early March, in the deepest part of the night, virtually no one stirred. The community was little more than a handful of homes and buildings, with the county courthouse in the center. The town was Mosby's to take. Outside wasn't a place people wanted to be. They wanted to be in a nice, warm bed with fires roaring in their fireplaces and not worry about anything outside until the next day. Mosby ordered the Union defector, Sergeant James Ames, to look for the raid's prime target, Colonel Percy Wyndham. Ames was sent with a party to the house in which he knew Wyndham had his quarters. But fortune was in Wyndham's favor that time. For that evening, he had gone to Washington by train. His nemesis had eluded him completely, but Mosby's disappointment would quickly disappear. Just one block away, fast asleep in bed, an even better prisoner was waiting, a Union Brigadier General. At 2 a.m. on March 9, 1863, Rebel Lieutenant John Singleton Mosby and his tiny band of rangers were on a secret mission far inside Union lines. In a letter to his superior, General Jeb Stewart, he made his report. I determined to make the attempt to reach Fairfax Courthouse, where the general headquarters of that portion of the army were established. The few guards stationed around the town, unsuspecting of danger, were easily captured. In the darkness, the rebels had free reign in the tiny Virginia village. Mosby had hoped to capture Union Colonel Percy Wyndham, but he was away that night. Instead, one of the captured guards told Mosby an even better target awaited him nearby. Brigadier General Edwin Stoughton was quartered at the home of Dr. Thomas Gunnell, just one block away from the courthouse. What happened next has become a legend. General Stoughton was easily captured by Mosby and his men, and it's a really entertaining story. Mosby came in and very boldly banged on the front door, saying, I have reports for the general's eyes only. Lieutenant Prentice, who was Stoughton's aide, opened an upper window and looked down. And when he found out that it was a message for the general, he staggered down the stairs in his shirt and underdrawers, opened the front door, probably yawning, and for his work, got a pistol stuck in his ribs. 
I took hold of his nightshirt, whispered my name in his ear, and told him to take me to General Stoughton. As Mosby and his men moved through the house towards the staircase, uh, they noticed several empty champagne bottles as if there had been some kind of party or foray. General Stoughton loved to live the good life, and he had given a party earlier in the evening. Once they got upstairs, sure enough, there was General Stoughton sound asleep in his bed. Mosby just saw him as a sitting duck. Now, the story goes that Mosby woke him up by slapping him on his backside. And you can imagine him startling awake. Stoughton did not realize the situation and thought that somebody was taking a rude familiarity with him. He asked in an indignant tone what all this meant. Mosby says, have you heard of the Ranger Mosby? The sleepy general says, yes, have you caught him? Mosby says, I am Mosby and I have caught you. Get dressed and come with me. For Mosby to come into the Union uh, camp like this and try and take the general literally right out of his bed was a very audacious act. He took out a coal from the fire and actually wrote his name on the wall so that there would be no question as to who came in and took the general when they looked at it afterwards. Stoughton was forced to dress. The rangers had to hurry so they could get home while it remained dark. Mosby told the general the town was surrounded by Jeb Stewart's cavalry, which in reality was not even close. My motive in trying to deceive Stoughton was to deprive him of all hope of escape and to induce him to dress quickly. Stoughton was a brave soldier, but a fop. He dressed before a looking glass, carefully. He forgot his watch and left it on the bureau, but one of my men took it and gave it to him. By 3.30 in the morning, Mosby's rangers with their prisoners and horses began to leave town. On their way, they passed a house where Union Colonel Robert Johnstone was staying. With Wyndham out of town, Johnston is in command, and he hears these horses coming through the street. So he opens up a window and challenges them to find out who they are and why they're out at that time of night. <laughs> the only response he got was laughter from Mosby's men, probably a combination of adrenaline and uh, excitement. And perhaps they also laughed with a southern accent. I don't know. When laughter meted his inquiry, he knew things were not good. So he slammed the window down and took off out the back door. I ordered several men to capture him. They burst through the front door, but the man's wife met them in the hall and held her ground like a lioness. She was biting and kicking and scratching and screaming, at which point the Confederates simply laughed and said, this isn't worth it. She's going to wake the entire town. Let's go on. The details of Colonel Johnstone's fate are somewhat clouded by history's various accounts. The report of a Union provost, for instance, said Colonel Johnstone made his escape from them in a nude state by accident. Now, there are some conflicting reports as to whether he actually had a nightshirt on or not. Some reports say that he was naked going out the back to begin with. Others say that he lost his nightshirt in his attempt to find a suitable hiding place. Now, what's really happened is that Johnstone has gone out into the back garden and hidden underneath the outhouse. And the story goes that he stayed there for quite a while, really stunk when he came back out, and that his wife would not embrace him until he'd had a bath. As a result of his rather disgusting hiding place, he obtained the nickname Outhouse Johnston, which he never managed to live down. But Mosby's rangers, successful so far, had yet to make their getaway. Union lines were ahead of them, and sunrise was only three hours away. Discovery would mean disaster for this secret mission, and all of their lives were very much at stake. On March 9, 1863, Confederate guerrilla fighter John Singleton Mosby and his men silently rode out of Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia, with Union Brigadier General Edwin Stoughton as prisoner. They hoped they would not be noticed by the Union forces surrounding them. 
They took the south road out of town, hoping any Yankee pursuit would follow that direction. But then they made a sharp turn west, where their route through the woods would land them safely in friendly Virginia territory. Mosby's report to General Jeb Stewart summed it all up neatly. The fruits of this expedition are one brigadier general, two captains, and 30 enlisted men prisoners. We also brought off 58 horses, also a considerable number of arms. I had 29 men with me, sustained no loss. They all behaved admirably. And not a single shot had been fired. Mosby was instantly famous throughout the South and notorious in the North. In the Federal Army, there was complete panic. There was a fear that this raider could do the same against President Lincoln while he slept in the White House. It was said that the Union actually picked up boards on the chain bridge each night because they were afraid Mosby might use that avenue to get into DC. But as Mosby later recalled, President Lincoln had a different reaction. There is an anecdote told of Mr. Lincoln that when it was reported to him that Stoughton had been captured, he remarked with his characteristic humor that he did not mind so much the loss of a general, for he could make another in five minutes, but he hated to lose the horses. Mosby's Rangers continued to harass federal troops until the war was over. A hero to the South, he was a wanted man in the North. Mosby did become a hunted man, more and more so even throughout the war. There were numerous attempts to capture him all throughout the rest of the war. None were successful. So he really was able to keep the North on their toes. In this respect, Mosby did just what James Andrews did in his secret mission to steal a southern locomotive. Each kept enemy troops occupied and away from battles where they were otherwise needed. He had said that a partisan's value is not in the amount of troops that he kills, but in the amount he is able to keep watching or guarding or tied up. Fairfax Courthouse still stands today. The original building dates to 1800, but it is no longer at the center of a few dozen odd houses. Instead, it overlooks the busy traffic of modern day Fairfax, Virginia, now a suburb of Washington, DC. Two hours to the south is Virginia's Petersburg National Battlefield Park, where the grassy terrain disguises evidence of another secret mission. Here, in 1864, a Union regiment of Pennsylvania coal miners began digging a tunnel. It was the very heart of a covert plan to blow a hole in the Confederate trenches surrounding the city of Petersburg beyond. History knows it as the Battle of the Crater. It was a secret mission that surprised and horrified everyone who witnessed it. None of the participants had seen anything of the scale and drama and sheer shock value of the explosion of the crater. By the spring of 1864, General Ulysses S. Grant was in overall command of the Union Army. He targeted Petersburg, Virginia, as a way of cutting off nearby Richmond, the Confederate capital, where General Robert E. Lee was in command. Petersburg was a major transportation center at that time. There were five railroads radiating from the city, supplying Confederate forces that were holding the trenches around Richmond. And so Grant ordered attacks on the Confederate trenches surrounding Petersburg. The fighting began on June 15, 1864. Federal troops stormed the rebel fortifications in what one Union soldier described as a hurricane of shot and shell. Lee reinforced the lines around Petersburg, and Grant's army was stopped. Just in the first four days at Petersburg, Grant suffered 10,000 casualties. Lee suffered, we estimate, about maybe three, 4,000 casualties. So Grant decides to end the frontal assaults. He realizes he's not gaining anything. He's just losing troops. 
and that's when the siege mentality takes over. The occupation by thousands of troops turned the Virginia landscape into a near desert. Under the brutal summer sun, Union soldiers steeled themselves to the dreaded prospect of a prolonged siege. But eager to end the standoff, soldiers of the 48th Pennsylvania Infantry came up with the idea for a secret mission aimed at the enemy trenches just 100 yards away. One of the members of the 48th Pennsylvania told one of his buddies that if we could dig a mine right underneath that Confederate earthworks in front of us, roughly 100 yards, we could blow a huge crater in front of that and walk right into the city of Petersburg. Maybe take the city, maybe end the war. And by some accounts, the colonel of the 48th Pennsylvania, Colonel Henry Pleasance, walked by and he heard this. Henry Pleasance, as it happened, was a mining engineer in civilian life. Many of his men had dug coal in the mines of Pennsylvania. By incredible luck, these men with these skills were stationed at the closest point between the opposing lines. In some other areas of the siege lines, the lines are over a mile apart, maybe two miles apart. It was almost like it was meant to be in some ways that these guys just happened to be at that point. Pleasance took the idea to his commanding officer, Brigadier General Robert Potter, and together they met with their superior, Major General Ambrose Burnside. Pleasance explained how his men could dig a tunnel roughly 500 feet long. They could pack it with powder and blast a gaping hole in the enemy lines. General Burnside hears the account and says, well, Nothing's really been tried like this on the Eastern Front. This might be something to keep the guys busy, might be something to do, so let's, let's give it a shot. But the Army chain of command was long and difficult. Burnside went up the line to his superior, Major General George Meade, a sour-faced man with a disposition to match. Often called the snapping turtle, he was skeptical of the 500-foot tunnel from the beginning. Conventional wisdom, in military mining was that a shaft could not be any longer than 400 feet. General George Meade kind of hemmed and hawed and said, you know, this has never really been done. I mean, this is really new territory as far as this distance. This is a big distance. The chief of engineers of the Army of the Potomac, Major Duane, said he didn't think this could work either. The problem was ventilation. All of the air in the mine came from the tunnel's mouth, and fresh air could travel only so far. Conventional wisdom said 400 feet was the upper limit for any mine. At least that is what General Meade and his chief engineer believed. The coal miners had no doubt that this could be done. It's the non-coal miner people, the higher command, who had the doubts about it. They just did not know anything about coal mining and digging tunnels, uh, but these guys did. Meade grudgingly agreed to take the idea up the line to his superior, General Ulysses S. Grant, headquartered at nearby City Point, Virginia. Grant agreed to let the soldiers start digging. If it was up to Meade, I don't think it would have happened, but Grant was the one that said let them dig, and I believe Grant was very open-minded to new ideas and new approaches. Uh, we would call it thinking out of the box today. Besides, Grant said, it would give the soldiers something to do. Colonel Henry Pleasant's own words recalled the secret mission and all its frustrations. It was commenced at 12 p.m. the 25th of June, 1864, without tools, lumber, or any of the materials requisite for such work. The Army failed to supply proper tools, so the miners took their entrenchment picks, straightened the ends, and shortened the handles. This way, they could swing them effectively in a cramped tunnel no more than four and a half feet high. To remove the dirt without wheelbarrows, the miners put handles on ordinary wooden hardtack boxes. Hardtack box was about yay big by yay big, and maybe a foot deep, it was designed to hold about a thousand hardtack crackers, and the men would put the dirt in this to carry it out of the tunnel. The problem with it was that you have to imagine how uncomfortable that was to be a soldier in there, hours at a time, 
digging this earth, shoveling it into a box, handing it to someone behind you, going again, keeping going back and forth. It was really a very uncomfortable process. Colonel Pleasance appointed a tough sergeant to supervise the digging. Another veteran of the Pennsylvania coal mines, his name was Harry Reese. Sergeant Reese was so devoted to his duties of constructing this tunnel that he not only set up his sleeping quarters in front of the mouth of the tunnel, but he also took all of his meals there. No one went in and out of the tunnel without first passing by Sergeant Reese. As the work progressed, the Union Command virtually ignored the operation, still believing it would never work. The Union Command's number one reservation about digging the tunnel was how you could ventilate a shaft that was 500 feet long. And you could lock me up in a room for a week, and I would have never thought of a very simple principle that hot air rises. Colonel Pleasance used that principle in an ingenious ventilation system. A fire at the bottom of a vertical shaft created a current of rising air. To keep the fire from drawing air directly from the mouth of the tunnel, the entrance was blocked with a removable barrier. A wooden ventilation duct ran through the barrier and extended the whole length of the mine. With the barrier in place, the fire fueled a constant flow that drew fresh air from the outside through the duct, allowing the miners to breathe as they dug. Pleasance described the impressive scale of the project. The main gallery was 510 and 8 tenths feet in length. The whole amount of material excavated was 18,000 cubic feet. I finished the whole thing, lateral galleries and all, ready to put the powder in on the 23rd of July. The naysayers were proved wrong. Now the secret mission became one for General Burnside. He was ready with a battle plan, little knowing that second guessing from the upper command would jeopardize the whole operation. By the summer of 1864, Union troops were planning a secret mission they hoped would bring the Civil War to an end. Three years of fighting had done little to resolve the issues that divided the United States of America from the Confederate South. In Washington, President Abraham Lincoln contemplated a re-election campaign plagued by his failure to defeat the rebels. And at Petersburg, Virginia, General Ulysses S. Grant faced both political and military pressure in a siege against Confederate lines that would not end. Grant was stymied having to look for alternative ways to end the stalemate at Petersburg and win the kind of victory that might launch Abraham Lincoln's re-election campaign back into the White House. But on June 23rd, Grant suddenly had an alternative. A regiment of Pennsylvania coal miners had secretly excavated a 511-foot tunnel so they could blast a giant hole in the rebel trenches. General Ambrose Burnside, commander of the 9th Corps, was charged with formulating a plan for the battle to follow. What he had come up with was a plan that was different for one major reason at the time, and that was who was going to lead the attack. The leading force of the 9th Corps was going to be its fourth division, which was made up entirely of African-American soldiers. United States colored troops, as they were known, were not officially allowed in the Army until 1863. Nearly 200,000 joined, two-thirds of them ex-slaves. I think that most of the black troops, no matter whether they were former slaves or had always been free, had one common interest and that was proving that they were equal to whites who lived in America. As the tunnel digging started, Burnside ordered his black soldiers to begin training under their white commander, Brigadier General Edward Ferrero. Burnside knew the colored troops had largely been assigned to menial tasks in the rear. He knew they had little exposure to battle, but to him, this was an asset. The black division had not experienced the kind of combat that the other divisions in the 9th Corps had gone through. 
Unlike their white comrades, the black troops were not as shy about making attacks against fortifications, about leaving the cover of their trenches and going forward. The black troops felt a zeal and a passion in what they were doing, and General Burnside felt that this battle would need that passion and zeal. Once the hole was blown in the rebel lines, Burnside's plan had the first black soldiers sweeping left and right to clear the adjacent trenches. Then other units would avoid entering the crater, carefully go around it, and head for nearby Cemetery Hill. Burnside's white divisions would protect the attack on each flank. By seizing the high ground at Cemetery Hill, the Federals could emplace artillery overlooking Petersburg compel the Confederates to abandon the city and along with it their supply system to Richmond. In many ways, the explosion of the mine promised the end of the war in Virginia if it was successful. Colonel Henry Pleasants wrote of loading the tunnel with powder four days after it was completed. Having received the order to charge our mine on the 27th of July, I commenced putting in the powder. The charge consisted of 320 kegs of powder, each containing about 25 pounds, four tons. It wasn't really safe to walk around a battlefield with 25 pounds of powder uh, on your purse. They are getting shot at by sharpshooters, uh, shells are going off. Disaster could have happened at any moment in time. A shell blowing up or a bullet hitting one of these kegs. So I'm sure these soldiers were very nervous while this is going on. Burnside was ready with his black division, but as he discussed final details with General Meade, optimism turned to alarm as the snapping turtle upended the battle plan. Meade insisted on using the more experienced white troops to lead the attack. General Burnside insisted, this has to work. My white divisions are decimated from the attacks. This is the largest division. This is the division that has to make this assault. So he demands they go to General Grant. The next day, Burnside briefed commanders of his white divisions on their role in the battle, confident that General Grant would support him. Burnside had suffered a major defeat earlier in the war at Fredericksburg, Virginia. Facing the ridicule of his colleagues, he hoped his plan at Petersburg would redeem him. As Burnside met with his subordinates, Meade himself appeared at the tent. He brought with him Grant's verdict, and the news was not good. The military goals now had a sudden political component. The blacks would not lead the attack. Grant's viewpoint was, should the attack wind up as a disaster, that he would be accused of sacrificing the black troops because he didn't care about them at a time in which the United States war aims included the end of slavery. The devastated Burnside was at a loss. None of the men before him had trained their divisions for the complex maneuvers the battle required. Who now should lead the attack? In the crisis, Burnside tossed logic aside. Burnside placed lots in a hat, had the officers pull lots out of the hat, and as luck would have it, perhaps the worst division commander in the entire Union Army earned the honor of leading the assault. That man was Brigadier General James Ledley of New York. He had a reputation for drinking and had managed to conceal his military incompetence, earning promotions in spite of it. As all this was happening, fuse was being laid to fire the mine as ordered at 3.30 the following morning. Other plans may have gone awry, but Colonel Pleasance and his men were ready. As the rebels slept across the way, the secret mission would soon be revealed with a bang. At 3 a.m. on July 30th, 1864, Union Major General Ambrose Burnside looked at his watch. He stood at his headquarters in the trench lines outside Petersburg, Virginia. His secret mission was about to be launched. Below ground, in the mine dug under enemy lines, Colonel Henry Pleasance of the 48th Pennsylvania 
the defuse. It would take 30 minutes to detonate a massive bomb beneath the rebel earthworks. The quartermaster, Sergeant Joseph Gould, remembered the events in the regimental history. Colonel Pleasance mounted our earthworks waiting for the grand explosion. Anxious with excitement he waited, for the fuse had been lighted by his own hand, and a few seconds would prove the truth or incorrectness of his theory. But there was a problem. 30 minutes passed, and there was no explosion. Colonel Pleasance hoped to get what was called safety fuse. Instead of getting safety fuse, Pleasance was sent regular fuse uh, in very short lengths, in some cases only 10 feet long which meant that the 48th Pennsylvania would have to splice this fuse in many places. It was a frustration that plagued the project. General George Meade and his staff, skeptical of the plan, were unresponsive to Pleasant's requisitions. Safety fuse would have burned more reliably. Continuous lengths would have eliminated troublesome splices. Thousands of Union troops waited for a command to charge. Crowded into trenches, they endured the summer heat hanging over them, even in the dead of night. As the minutes passed, Sergeant Harry Reese, Pleasant's tough mind boss, was anxious to investigate, certain the fuse had gone out at a splice. At 4.15, more than an hour after the fuse was lit, Reese, together with Lieutenant Jacob Doughty, bravely re-entered the mine. Imagine these two guys. They go into this tunnel. They know that there's 8,000 pounds of powder at the end of this tunnel. They're following the fuse, and they're trying to find out why it hasn't gone off. So I'm sure these two soldiers are very nervous. Um, they don't want it to go off while they're in this tunnel, of course. They finally find that a fuse had gone out at a splice. They lit the splice, and I'm sure they lost no time at all running back down that tunnel to get out of that thing before it blew up. Everything, with all its unknowns, was now in place. General Burnside's drastically altered battle plan. The white divisions hastily prepared. The black division, now at the rear instead of the lead. And across the way, the Confederates asleep. Reese and Doughty came scrambling out of the tunnel, their margin of safety cut razor thin. Only five minutes later, at 4.44 a.m., the mine at Petersburg exploded. Colonel Henry Pleasance remembered the scene as it unfolded. I stood on top of our breastworks and witnessed the effect of the explosion on the enemy. It so completely paralyzed them that the breach was practically four or 500 yards in breadth. The explosion that would occur on the morning of July 30th was unprecedented in North American history. When we hear an explosion today, it's boom and it's over with just a matter of a second or two. This explosion went on and on. Gunpowder back in those days burnt slow. I imagine it took at least 15 to 20 seconds just for the explosion to take place. It was the equivalent of the, of the atomic bomb going off for the men who witnessed it. The first phase of the secret mission was complete. Catching the South off guard, the Union had blown a giant hole in the enemy lines. The crater from the blast was 170 feet wide and 30 feet deep. The rebels sustained 278 immediate casualties. There's a story of one of the men being blown up, and as he's going up, he's seeing uh, the company cook going down, who yells back at him, I'll have breakfast ready for you when you reach the bottom. On the Union side, falling debris disoriented the men assigned to lead the charge against the rebels. These were troops of Brigadier General James Ledley, who is said to have seen them off before retiring to a bunker with a cup of liquor. Ledley apparently never briefed his men on the plan to go around the crater. Instead, they went straight for it. When they reached the giant hole, the spectacle stopped them cold. What they find is pieces of people, pieces of horses, Confederates that are buried, alive, and they're just shocked by what they see. 
their immediate reaction was to save these guys' lives, which is very strange. They're out there, actually out there, they're supposed to be killing these people. But because of what they saw initially, they actually tried to help these Confederates out. It takes them over 40 minutes to get organized and get to figure out that we need to start moving forward. Burnside's three white divisions poured into the crater, creating a tangled log jam of confusion. And by this time, the Confederates, stunned by the blast, began to recover and were fighting back. The Union troops were exposed and vulnerable. Those who tried to advance beyond the crater's edge were likely to be cut down by rebels firing from cover in the remnants of their trenches. Finally, after three hours of fighting, Burnside sent his black division into the battle. They were originally intended to lead the attack. Instead, they assumed the follow-up role once intended for one of the white divisions. Now they had to wade through the confused battlefield to reach the positions they had trained for. When the black troops eventually went in, they went uh, and swung around to the north of the crater. And by this time, Confederate reinforcements had arrived on the scene under the command of General William Mahone. Mahone, a wiry man with a long black beard, marched his men three miles to the battle. His advance guard was a brigade of local Virginians only 800 strong. They were vastly outnumbered, but did not yet realize the color of their opponents. When these Virginia troops hit these black troops, when they realized they were fighting black troops, they went berserk. It was an insult to them to actually think that a black man was equal on a battlefield as a white man. These two forces with two separate identities, totally different ideas, came together on one field of battle and now found themselves in fear and enraged by one another. Racism doesn't exist in today's world compared to what it would have been like back in those days. The worst story that I've come across in this battle, this one black soldier is getting beat by a ramrod over the head by a Confederate soldier. He's, the Confederate soldier is holding this guy while the other Confederate soldier is loading his weapon so he can kill this man. This man is begging for his life. He tells him, I'll be your slave for the rest of my life. I'll do whatever you want. The guy loads, he shoots, he hits the guy's belt buckle. He has to reload again. They finally do kill this man. And this is just one of the horrible stories that take place at the Battle of the Crater. The Confederate policy called for shooting all black soldiers. They were not to be taken prisoner. So the Union's colored division suffered more casualties than any other in the battle. The secret mission that held so much promise was on the verge of failure. The Union soldiers fighting to save it were soon to be devastated by a lethal weapon. In the chaos of a secret mission gone bad, Union troops were trapped in a giant crater on the Confederate trench lines outside Petersburg, Virginia. The crater was the result of a massive bomb secretly planted by Union miners. Now soldiers trying to exploit the breach in rebel lines were pinned down by a counterattack led by rebel general William Mahone, who brought a destructive weapon into play. When the battle was reaching its climax, the men of William Mahone's Confederate division had started bringing up artillery pieces right to the edge of the crater itself. What they brought up were Cohorn mortars. The Cohorn mortar, named for its 17th century Dutch inventor, was light enough to be carried by four men. It lobbed a shrapnel-loaded shell on a high trajectory and turned the crater into a crucible of blood. The scene inside the crater was indescribable. Shells exploding over the heads of the men, artillery projectiles going into the soldiers who had reached the rim of the crater, the Confederate counterattackers reaching the edge of the crater, firing at point blank range into their Federal opponents who were packed so closely together they couldn't move and defend themselves. There was so much blood spilled in the crater that pools of it gathered on the hard clay before it sunk into the earth. It was a scene that defied 
description, even from veterans who had been through three years of hell in the Civil War. In the end, the Union troops surrendered. The secret mission had failed. Confederate casualties numbered 1,500, while the Union lost nearly 4,000. Quartermaster Sergeant Joseph Gould was bitter in his disappointment. Our mine explosion caused deep alarm within the enemy's works that morning, and had our generals shown as much interest in the attack as the enemy showed in the defense, there would have been a glorious victory, and the war would have in all probability ended a year sooner than it did. When the Battle of the Crater was over, by roughly 1 o'clock in the afternoon on July 30th, 1864, it was a tremendous victory for the Confederate force and an awful defeat for the Union Army. General Grant himself would say it was the saddest affair he had ever seen throughout the entire war. At the Battle of the Crater, the Union failed to break rebel lines around Petersburg. But General Ulysses S. Grant found opportunities elsewhere. In August 1864, he ordered General Philip P. Sheridan to Virginia's fertile Shenandoah Valley, where the culmination of his campaign would become infamous. He was destroying everything in sight, barns, home, the crops. It was devastation. It was more at all costs. Sheridan's operations in the Shenandoah Valley outraged the South. This is something new during the, in the Civil War. Suddenly, farmers, civilian innocent people, are being targeted by the armies. They're having their livelihoods taken away from them. This is unheard of. Cries for revenge in the South were not ignored. They inspired a secret mission to strike within Union territory. It would take place the day after Thanksgiving, November 25th, 1864. It was a Confederate plot to burn New York. This is a plot through, by the Confederate government to do through espionage what the army had failed to do, and that was to bring the war directly to the gates of the North's most prominent city. Of all the Confederate secret missions that were launched against the Union during the Civil War, the plot to burn New York was probably the most audacious. Audacity was needed by the South. After more than three years of war, its options were narrowing. The South knew that they no longer had the ability to wage war with material or manpower. Um, internally, the South knew that their days were numbered. What it wanted to do was create a, a peace treaty with the North in order to establish itself as a recognized sovereign state, its own nation, the Confederacy. A negotiated peace would have been supported in the North by many opponents of President Lincoln. Among them was a strong faction nicknamed the Copperheads. The Copperheads were the peace faction of the Democratic Party, the ones who are seeking reconciliation with the South and a swift end to the war. But Lincoln's opponents lost momentum as the Union Army gained it. Sheridan's conquests in Virginia were coupled with September's occupation of Atlanta under William Tecumseh Sherman. The South grew desperate to exploit any remaining sentiment among Northerners to seek an early peace. This included espionage plots. This included new and fascinating inventions such as submarine warfare. Uh, they were using anything they could to possibly turn the tide in their favor. The South planned many missions under a confusing array of secret services in its State Department, War Department, Signal Corps, Navy, and more. One shadowy agency was known as the Confederate Mission to Canada. In its plans were rescues of Confederate prisoners, seizures of ships on the Great Lakes, a bank robbery in Vermont, and even a plot to manipulate the price of gold. The mission's leader was Jacob Thompson, who had once actually served the Union as Secretary of Interior. Jacob Thompson was regarded by Northern authorities as a criminal mastermind, really as a terrorist, uh, as we would know today. He is sent by Jefferson Davis to Canada with millions of dollars for the purposes of launching espionage raids against the North. Few of the plans hatched in Canada succeeded, but efforts continued. 
High on the list of targets was New York City, where copperheads were numerous and anti-Lincoln sentiment fierce. The rebels counted on the copperheads to raise arms to carry out their political aims. A Confederate raid would likely have strong local support. Lieutenant John Headley of Kentucky was one of the Confederates on the secret mission to burn New York, and the only one to write a first-person account. I was detailed to report to Colonel Jacob Thompson in Toronto, Canada, for service under his orders along the northern borders of the United States. The presidential election, which was to be held on the eighth day of November, was deemed an opportune time for the blow to be struck. Thompson briefed the men assigned to strike New York, all of them experienced Southern officers. He said other Northern cities would be struck as well, and well-armed copperheads would rise up to throw off the shackles of Union rule. Election day was the original target date. The Confederates were going to set a series of fires in New York, which would provide the cover for the copperheads, the armed troops that they were expecting to rise up to take over the government buildings and declare independence for New York. This is a plan of massive scope. They planned that by nightfall on election day, a Confederate flag would fly over the city of New York and that the entire region would be under their control. It was arranged that we should arrive in New York about 10 days before the election and become familiar with the streets and localities of the city. The Confederates arrived in a city that was famous then as it is now for its intense activity. The atmosphere was not unlike the scenes preserved in the first films of New York, taken years later. People living in the city at that time faced the same problems that people do now. It was crowded, it was dirty, the streets were dusty, they smelt of horse manure. The Confederate officers on their secret mission found it easy to blend in. It would not be at all difficult for these men to go about their business in New York without raising suspicion. For the simple fact, they looked like everyone else. They dressed like everyone else. Uh, New York was such a heterogeneous community that it would not be unlikely to hear someone speaking with a Southern accent. But these Southerners suddenly found themselves at risk. An insider among the rebels in Canada was a spy, and word of the plan leaked. New York newspapers printed a warning to Northern mayors about the rebel conspiracy. It came directly from U.S. Secretary of State William Seward. General Benjamin Butler was dispatched to New York with 3,500 troops. With the show of force, the Confederates lost their Copperhead support. As soon as it was known that Butler was coming to the city with federal troops, they all backed out, every one of them. But they gave up. They left the Confederate officers who had, who had come down from Canada, they left them in the lurch, in a sense. The election went off without incident. Lincoln lost New York City to his opponent, General George McClellan, but the president won the rest of the country overwhelmingly. The Copperheads had backed out of the plot, but the Confederate officers from Canada were still in New York, and they decided to burn the city on their own. We had told Colonel Thompson he could expect to hear from us in New York. We announced our purpose to set the city on fire and give the people a scare, if nothing else and let the government at Washington understand that burning homes in the South might find a counterpart in the North. The conspirators were further inflamed a week later when General William T. Sherman ordered the burning of Atlanta as he departed for his notorious march to the sea. I think the Confederate officers who had come down out of Canada, I think they saw themselves as angels of revenge. Here they were in New York. They were all ready to go. They had worked themselves up to it. Boom, why not go ahead? On the night before we had determined to strike the blow, our party of Confederates met uptown and arranged our final plans. On the night of November 24th, Headley was chosen to pick up their primary weapon a collection of incendiary bombs made of a material he described as Greek fire. These conspirators hired a Greenwich Village chemist who lived near Washington Square to concoct a mixture involving phosphorus and a very flammable solvent. The 
Phosphorus is a very volatile material. In fact, it's very dangerous. You don't dare touch it with your hands. You have to use tongs or pincers or certainly heavy rubber gloves. The process was hazardous every step of the way. The phosphorus had to be handled while immersed in water. Any tool that touched it could not be used for anything else. The chemist cut it into small pieces, dissolved it in the solvent, and portioned it into four ounce bottles. As John Headley recalled, the mysterious chemist produced the satchel of bottles with no questions asked. He handed it over to me without saying a word. I turned and departed with the same silence. None of the party knew anything about Greek fire except that the moment it was exposed to the air, it would blaze and burn everything it touched. We found it to be a liquid resembling water. We were now ready to create a sensation in New York. In their plan, 15 hotels were targeted, with most of them located in clusters along a three-mile stretch of Broadway, New York's magnificent Main Street. From the hotels, the fire would spread quickly with the entire heart of the city erupting in flames. It's no accident that they targeted the hotels in New York because the hotels were not just stopping places for travelers or tourists coming through, but they were the places where the political and financial business of the city was done. The plan was now set. In just 24 hours, the Confederates would spring into action, launching their secret mission to burn down the city of New York. At 6 p.m. on November 25, 1864, seven Confederate officers disguised as civilians met in the strictest secrecy. They were plotting to burn New York City. Fire was the perfect weapon. American cities in the 18th and 19th century were really fire traps. The buildings were mostly made out of wood. They were densely packed. People lived in very, very close quarters. And that made the possibility of a catastrophic fire really a genuine threat on a day-to-day -day basis. The Confederates were armed with bottles of a volatile phosphorus mixture designed to ignite when exposed to air. John Headley wrote of their preparations for action. The bottles, having been wrapped in paper, were put in our coat pockets. Each man took 10 bottles. It was agreed that our operation should begin promptly at 8 o'clock p.m. The first fire would be set at the St. James Hotel at Broadway and 26th Street. There, as in all 15 of the hotels, the Confederates would follow a basic plan. They would go into their rooms, lock the doors, and take the bed sheets, um, whatever other flammable material might be in that room, make a large pile in the center, pour the phosphorus on it, and then lock the door and leave behind them. Once they had poured the phosphorus over the bedding, they closed the window so smoke could not be seen by anyone before fire filled the room. Shortly before 9 p.m., a bell began to ring atop one of New York's fire towers. It was the first of many bells that night, an alarming symphony of a city under attack. New York City had built fire towers around the city, and you could hear those big bells ringing throughout the city, and it was actually a familiar sound. You expected to hear the fire tower bells ringing once, twice a day. But it would have been highly, highly unusual, probably unprecedented to have over a dozen fire alarms going off in a single day. Panic struck at the heart of New York as crowds fled at every site where fires were set. One of the Confederates, Captain Robert Cobb Kennedy, wasn't finished yet. He went to Barnum's Museum after setting his hotel fires. In writing of the event, Lieutenant Headley described Barnum's as a target of opportunity for Kennedy. Coming down a stairway, the idea occurred to him that there would be fun to start a scare. He broke a bottle, he said, on the edge of a step, 
like he would crack an egg, and he got out to witness the result. But the Barnum's fire fizzled, and it soon became clear to the Confederates that whatever excitement they had caused, New York was not consumed with flames. In depending on their phosphorus bombs, they had made a serious error. The problem with phosphorus is, is that it requires a large amount of oxygen to feed the fire. By locking the room and closing the windows, they cut off the oxygen and thus prevented the fire from burning the way they intended to do so. They didn't know how to handle their own material. The fires, creating more smoke than flame, were discovered and extinguished primarily by staff at the hotels. The plot had been foiled, but New Yorkers were enraged. New Yorkers were appalled by the fact that here they were a city that actually voted against Abraham Lincoln, and now the Confederates' uh, spies came in to set fire to a city. New York City was not very happy with the South. Revenge. That, that was the keynote uh, the next day. Everybody wanted, who are these people? Let's get, let's hang them. Retaining their anonymity, the Confederate officers quietly traveled by rail back to Canada. Robert Cobb Kennedy, the man who tried to burn Barnum's museum, was the only one of the Confederates captured. Kennedy had received a wound at Shiloh, wound in his thigh, and it made him walk with a very pronounced limp. And it was this limp that was used to uh, identify him. Kennedy was put on trial, defended by civilian lawyer Edwin Stoughton, the same man whose army career was ruined when he was captured by Mosby and his rangers at Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia, in 1863. Stoughton and Kennedy had been classmates at West Point, but given the outrage in New York, there was little Stoughton could do for his friend. The attempt to set fire to the city of New York was one of the greatest atrocities of the age. General John Dix, Union commander in New York, issued the military court's judgment. It was not a mere attempt to destroy the city, but to set fire to crowded hotels in order to secure the greatest possible destruction of human life. The finding? Guilty. Robert C. Kennedy will be hanged by the neck until he is dead. In this, a secret mission near the end of America's most costly conflict, the concepts of warfare versus terrorism were blurred. The Confederate plot to burn New York City was nothing more than a terrorist attack. It was an attempt by a government that had their back against the wall. And when any government has their back against the wall, they go at all measures to save themselves. From the Confederate standpoint, what they did was not terrorism. They were simply doing what the Northern troops were doing in the Shenandoah Valley, or what Sherman was doing in Atlanta. They were following through on war as hell, war as total. At Fort Lafayette in New York's harbor, Robert Cobb Kennedy went to the gallows on March 25th, 1865. He was drunk, unruly, and scared. Just as Kennedy was about to be hung, as the noose was around his neck, he started to sing an Irish ditty that thieves and, and murderers in Ireland sang before they were hung. Trust the luck. Trust the luck, stare fate in the face, for your heart will be easy if it's in the right place. Robert Cobb Kennedy was the last Confederate soldier executed before the end of the war. New York City remained unharmed, but it was clear that it had dodged a dangerous bullet. The day after the fire, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle published an editorial that very accurately predicted that had the plot succeeded, that half of what they called the stateliest city in the world would have been a charred and blackened ruin. None of the buildings struck in 1864 remain standing in New York today. But the city remains a unique symbol of the American nation. And so to the enemies of the United States, New York will always be a target. On April 9th, 1865, two weeks after Kennedy's execution, Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, effectively ending the Civil War. The time for vast battles had come to an end, as had the need for secret missions. Places like Fairfax Courthouse, 
or Kennesaw, Georgia, once known as Big Shanty, would never have the same public recognition as Fredericksburg or Shiloh. New York and Petersburg would seldom be remembered for their roles in the undercover war. But the secret missions of the Civil War were executed with a passion that exceeded perhaps even the greatest battles of the conflict. And for that reason, their scale will never diminish their place in history.